Welcome back, and as always, thank you for joining in. So as a reminder, this is part two of a three-part series over J.C. Leyendecker and the Arrow Collar Man. As a reminder, part one, we talked about advertising, where it came from, how it works, all that good stuff. And then part two, we're going to talk about men's fashion and why the Arrow Collar was so popular. Like, why, why did people buy this thing? Uh, and in part three, we're going to talk about the artist and gender and all that good stuff. So, that's it. Last time we went over some broad strokes about how advertising started and how it works. We looked at this ad and saw that it's using aspirational feelings to sell a product. Viewers see a classy looking fella and want to emulate him and be aristocratic too. This messaging is important because detachable colors were representative of a cultural, social, and consumer shift in America that happened in the mid 19th to early 20th centuries. Most of this information is pulled from the scholarship of Dr. Carol Turbin, a former professor of sociology and history. Thank you for your amazing scholarship. I'll try not to butcher it too badly. Side note, all the information I'm giving you is just the briefest of overviews. If something is super interesting to you, please go read more. End of side note. According to Dr. Turbin, quote, detachable colors were invented and became popular because of shifts in the way prosperous people demonstrated respectability and affluence, end quote. Well-off men started to associate cleanliness of body and clothing as desirable social characteristics. You know, when you discover germs exist, personal hygiene kind of becomes a thing too. Often, the only part of an upper or middle class man's shirt that would be dirty would be the collar. These guys were not the ones doing physical labor. They were the ones wandering through libraries and drinking sniftos of brandy or something like that. Instead of laundering the whole garment, women started making detachable collars at home that could be removed, washed, starched, ironed, and sewn back in to save time. Yes, that was saving time. Having a clean collar was a status symbol. In fact, it's where the term white collar comes from, though it was initially meant as an insult to clerks from their wealthier, more elite superiors, since the clerks were the plebeians who relied on wages, gasp, and who were trying to dress above their stations. Having a white collar was a standard for upper class men, so it became a practice that lower, and especially middle class men who were anxious to climb the social ladder would emulate. That was the customer Peabody, Cluett, and company really got traction with. The Victorian ideal of a slender, self-restrained fella also got a bit of a tweak in this time period in America. As entrepreneurship waned a little, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, and Carnegie had built their empires for the most part. Manufacturing really took a hold of things. Factory ownership and factory management split into two different jobs, which gave a significant social break to the number of salaried middle-class employees, or white-collar workers. There was also a blurry visual line in America. We liked the idea of the self-made man, a worker who could pick himself up by his bootstraps and take over the world. This idea meant a stronger male physique was the new American ideal, perhaps a laborer who worked his way up to plant manager. This made it harder to discern whether someone was an actual laborer or from a higher class. Toss in a detachable collar and it could take a minute to figure out somebody's class and rank as opposed to a casual glance. A strong physical presence was mixed in with authority. Middle class men even started taking up boxing, a pastime formerly viewed as crude and unrefined. Beginning in the 1880s, most of the detachable collars available for sale in the U.S. were manufactured in Troy, New York. In 1907, Peabody, Cluett & Company, also conveniently based in Troy, introduced a new production line, the Arrow Collar. This detachable article was made of cotton instead of linen. While the design didn't really look different from what they and their competitors were already making, the cheaper fabric choice made the price point lower and more affordable to men who wanted to follow the fashions of their bosses. The softer cloth also made wearing one a more comfortable experience. The company was worried that making a cheaper, semi-soft product would damage their own respectability, so they hired an advertising manager, Charles M. Connolly, who then hired the celebrated illustrator of Saturday Evening Post fame, J.C. Leyendecker, to class the cotton collar up by making ads like this one. 
We'll learn more about Yule JC in the next video. Ads like these created a legacy that blew Connolly's expectations out of the water. Lion Decker's men emerged as the equivalent of the Gibson Girl, a subject that will get its own series down the line. Don't you worry. This brand campaign ran nonstop from 1907 to 1931. That's 24 years. Flo the Progressive Lady has only been around since 2008, but I'm secretly hoping she can give him a run for his money. Everybody wanted to be or be with that white, handsome, middle-class guy who was physically fit, smart enough to dress well and succeed in business, even when the odds were stacked against him. Buying an arrow collar made men feel like they were bettering themselves by wearing one, even if they were just a schleppy file clerk. Now that's branding. There was also a downturn in social judgment for middle-class guys working in offices that got reassigned to labor positions, or blue-collar workers who wore indigo-dyed work clothes. That stigma is still around, just ask Mike Rowe. That shift in gravitas that skews toward white-collar positions may feel like a big swing to happen within a 24-year time span, but cultural change doesn't always run at one speed. For instance, in 2020, parents might still be inclined to encourage their children to attend a university over a trade school, despite a better job placement rate and starting salary. That preference is one that keeps hanging around. However, 24 years ago, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram flat didn't exist. The incorporation of social media into American life and business was a really fast one. Looking at trends like these and debating the factors that cause things to speed up or slow down is a big part of what academics do. Lion Decker's illustrations picked up a wish and reflected a certain type of new man, but consumers are the ones who really gave him power. They bought these collars and this image of white American heterosexual masculinity hook, line, and sinker. He was circulated in magazines, newspapers, programs, and storefronts. He was emulated by rival companies, he received his own fan mail, and there was a satirical Broadway musical in 1925 called Helen of Troy, New York that was loosely based on the clue at Peabody and Company's success. Cole Porter used the arrow collar as a measure of excellence in his 1934 hit song, You're the Top, where he literally just lists a bunch of things he perceived as awesome and compares them to the woman he's singing to. A bold choice, but we're still talking about it, so there's that. Most people who have no idea of the background for this image would probably still feel warm and fuzzy toward it, though they may not be able to quite articulate why. That's how deeply entrenched in American social and visual culture this guy is. But what about Lion Decker? How did he draw up this dreamboat? We'll look at that next time. Later, Gators!